Oh, welcome back. So the project two is due today. Any uh, questions? Afterwards, all right. Please repeat the question. Yes, uh, we'll do that outside of offline. Yes, as they say, away from the TV camera. Okay. Well, uh, so we finished chapter three now, solving triangular systems, and now we're into chapter four, Cholesky factorization. Cholesky was a f French surveyor, and he invented a method for solving a system of equations of a particular kind, where the, I mean, he's, he's, his goal actually was to solve least squares problems. So least squares problems, you've got an overdetermined system of equations. There's too many equations and too few unknowns to solve it exactly. And the reason these systems of equations come up uh, is from surveying measurements. So you, you do a bunch of survey measurements and you have the unknowns are you know the positions of these points on the map you're trying to put but you measure them in many different ways and so you've got they're over it's an overdefined problem but you want it to be overdefined because if you just have one way that the, the the solution is defined you might get that wrong so the more measurements you take the more accurate it is so what you want to do in a least squares problem is you want to find a solution x that minimizes the two norm which is the square root of the sum of the squares of a vector. So find x that minimizes x minus b, or b minus ax as it's often written. So that was Cholesky's goal, was a rectangular matrix. But wait a minute, this is for symmetric square matrices. What's, what gives? Well, it turns out you can solve this by forming the normal equations, which is, I don't know why they call it normal, because it's really rather abnormal, because it's not a very good thing to do. Uh, numerically speaking, this can introduce um, ill conditioning because the linear algebra, algebraically speaking, the accuracy with which you can solve AX equals B is, is governed by something called the condition number. And I'm not going to go belabor that, what that is so much, but it's, it, 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 it governs the bounds on how accurate you can solve it, basically. Well, when you square, essentially you square the matrix, you square the condition number. You throw away half the bits of your result. That's what happens. But if the matrix is reasonably well conditioned, you can, you, you, you can still get a decent solution to this. So this was Cholesky's problem. He was trying to solve this, and he, he used the normal equations. And now this matrix right here, A transpose A, is symmetric. And it's also what's called positive definite. Um, positive definite says that uh, for any... Um, for any non-zero vector x, x transpose ax is positive. In, in physical systems, it has to do with the energy in a system. You can say the energy is, of a system is x transpose ax, and energy can never be negative. Uh, there's other things. Anyway, I'm, I'm going deeper into linear algebra than I said I, I would. <laughs> okay. But I just wanted to give you sort of the historical context of what this guy Cholesky did. This is the early 1900s, I think, when he invented this method. If I remember, he died in World War I. He was in the artillery, uh, an artillery company in France, I believe. So, so um, we're not, the, it turns out that Cholesky's method is, is I mean, it works, I mean, it, it's not the greatest method for solving these problems, but it's, a very powerful method for solving uh, methods like this, where the matrix A is symmetric and positive definite. And that kind of problem comes up a lot when you're doing engineering simulations. You get matrices that are symmetric and positive definite um, because of the way the physics works. Because, for example, you may be solving an energy problem, ener energy related, not, not energy as in the Department of Energy kind of, that sort of energy like gasoline, but energy of a system, physics, and, and such. And if you if you end up with that kind of system, then it's often the case that your matrix is symmetric, positive, definite. And if, if it is symmetric, positive, definite, you can cut half the work and half the memory 
uh, if you exploit that. So the if, if you know about Cholesky factorization already, you might wonder, well, gee, Professor Davis, why are you covering this first? Because Cholesky factorization is sort of a narrow niche. It's not, I mean, if you were stranded on a desert island and had one sparse or one matrix solver to pick, it would not be Cholesky factorization. It'd be something else. So why am I starting with this? The reason I'm starting with this is because the theory behind what we're doing in chapter four is a segue into the, in, in a more, it gives us hints as to how to do chapter five, which is this thing in our rates, QR factorization, chapter six, LU factorization. So it's sort of, it's more, it's more foundational in terms of theory than it is in, pra in, in practice. You would tend to pick one of the other methods if you only had one on a desert island to pick. But um, uh, so that's why I'm starting with one that's a little more uh, I don't know. Esoteric is not the right word. This is not an esoteric solver here to do AX equals B uh, with a Cholesky factorization. But it's it's not not quite as commonly used as the other methods. I'm doing this because it builds up the theory in a more incremental staircase kind of way. So uh, if you haven't, if you're not deep into linear algebra, don't freak out. I'm going to show you how all this works from scratch, and uh, assuming you just know how to multiply two matrices together, right? which you know how to do now. And you know block matrix multiply, because I've showed you that. So I'm going to derive Cholesky factorization just based on that knowledge, period. So if you, if you understand that, if you understand how to multiply two matrices together, if you understand who, how two block multiply, matrices can be multiplied together, then the, you'll follow this, just like I did with the triangular solve. Right? I, I wrote down things like L11 and it is an is a minus 1 by N minus 1 matrix, and then L21 and L22 is a, is, a, is a row vector and such. I sliced and diced up the matrices in various different ways to, to, to derive an algorithm right? to solve a triangular system. So if you follow that linear algebra, then this will be a piece of cake. There's another English idiom, piece of cake. A piece of cake, to explain that, it's something, it's something uh, as easy as pie. <laughs> What's that? No, actually, that just came to me. That was, I guess I'm supposed to please repeat the question. Oh, but that wasn't a question. That was just a, a snark. Yes, okay. So I don't have to repeat the fact that Ed said that I've been working on that for a while, so I won't repeat it. Nor will I give Ed's name. <laughs> oh, the best jokes require footnotes. That's my theory. Okay, so LL transpose equals A. That, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to factor a system into a, a lower triangular matrix times its transpose. You probably are more familiar with LU factorization where you factor a system into a lower triangular times an upper triangular matrix, and L and U are different. If you're not familiar with LU factorization, you're probably familiar with Gaussian elimination. Um, all these people have matrices and methods named after them. You know there's the... There's the Jacobian matrix, the Jacobi for named after again named Jacobi. There's a Hessian matrix. There's Gaussian elimination. Okay. And then there's matrix Davisian. <laughs> okay, okay. It's not named after me, but wouldn't that be cool? You know, I don't know. See, it's like monkey wrench. Have you ever heard the term monkey wrench? It's a, it's a tool. It's not named after monkeys. It's named after a guy named Monkey or something, Mon Monkey. Or, and it's just got corrupted over the years. And so this, you, this, you think of division. See, it was my ancestor in 1703 who, in, who, who invented Davisian. They called it the Davisian operator, but then it got corrupted over the years, and now it's just called division. That's, of course, 
pulling your leg. Anyway, so if you're familiar about Gaussian elimination and matrix division, <laughs> okay, uh, then this is just a special form of it. All right. So now, uh, there's many ways of slicing and dicing up this matrix to give us a factorization. The way I'm going to do it is this one I just drew in a race. where I'm going to make the matrix n minus 1, L11 is n minus 1 by n minus 1. Now, I said I was going to use matrix multiplication, right? But wait, this is matrix factorization. How can I use matrix multiplication just to, well, you'll see. The L, I don't know. I'm going to compute it. And uh, L22, you don't really have to put a transpose on, except unless, of course, you're dealing with complex matrices, then it's the complex conjugate transpose, or just the conjugate. But we're not dealing with complex matrices, so I'll leave off the T. Uh, A11, and the matrix A is symmetric. So A, how do I want to write this? I guess I'll write A21. A22 and write this as A21 transpose. Uh, this is shaped like this now. This is n minus 1 and 1. So I've got the first big chunk, of the, low, the top left corner of the matrix is most of the matrix. And the other half is just a little slice off of it. Okay. So now if we uh, go through and now we pretend with this, now we have a, a block matrix multiplication. The blocks are conformal, right? Because we've got n minus 1 and 1 and n minus 1 and 1. So I can do that. And the result here, this, the rows of this matrix are blocked the same way the rows of this matrix are blocked. And the, the blocking here is the same as the blocking here. And so block matrix multiply works just great. And now we can pretend we're doing 2 by 2 matrix multiply and forget the fact that these are blocks. And just put your finger down, go like that, and you get that L11, L11 transpose equals A11, right? Because this is 0. L11 times L11 transpose plus 0 times L22. Uh, no, no, no. Yeah, 0 times, I'm sorry, I'm here. Duh. Okay, so I'm doing this times this plus 0 times 0 equals A11. And then uh, let me, you know what? Let me let me put. What do I put in the? Yeah, let me revise this equation just a little bit to match the one in the book. And I realized why I did that because it makes it a little bit simpler with the notation. Okay, apologize for the rewrite there. So uh, this, by the way, is not how Cholesky derived his method. Just to let you know. But it is a derivation of his method. OK, so we've got L11 times L11 transpose equals A11. And then I've got this equation I could write down. I can write down that L11 times L12 transpose equals A12, right? Do you buy it? So that's this equation for A12. And then there's a third equation I need to write, which is this one times this one. So here I get, whoops, I've got transposes in two places. That's not very good. I'm sorry. I put an extra T here. That T shouldn't be there. And neither should this. I'm sorry. I hope you're not writing it in pen. Anybody have a pen they're writing with? If you are, you're very bold. OK, so then I've got L12 transpose L12 plus L22 squared. I'm not going to worry about the fact that it might be complex conjugate transposed equals A22. So these are the three equations now that we get from this block matrix multiplication. So. We know what A is, and we don't know what L is, so how can we attack this? 
these three equations to solve for each piece of L? Well, the most natural way to do it is to look at the first one and to say, hey, look, there's my recursive instance, right? This is a system of equations. It's n minus 1 by n minus 1. And I want to find the Cholesky factorization of it. Oh. So if by induction I know how to do it, so if by induction I can solve a system of size n minus 1 by n minus 1, then, so I can make this as an assumption as an inductive hypothesis. Then I can say, well, if I can fill in the rest of the details, I can extend this to a factorization of an n by n matrix. That's cool. And so now um, we'd have to worry about the base case. So let me, let me do that. The base case is the Cholesky factorization of a scalar. Okay, so we have LL transpose equals A. So L is the square root of A. This tells you one thing. This tells you that if you want to leave, stick with real arithmetic, which we do, then the Cholesky factorization does not ex exist for a negative number. Okay, and in fact, that's that's okay because if I have x transpose a x, if this is true, and this is just scalars for any non-zero x, I get a x squared has to be zero. Well, is, this is true as long as a is is positive. Because x squared will be positive. Because x, it, the matrix is positive definite if for any non-zero x, this is this is true. So if x is non-zero, x squared has to be positive. And if so, in order in order in order for a x squared to be positive, a must be positive, which is exactly what I have here. And in fact, the easiest way to check to see if a matrix is symmetric and positive definite is one to first check if it's symmetric. Well, that's easy. A equals A transpose. The next thing to check is you do a you try a Cholesky factorization, <laughs> and if it works, it's positive definite. Done. Um, so by induction, let's assume we can solve this system of equations, and then ask the question: Well, what do we do? What, what can we do next? Well, this equation here now falls falls open to us. Well, now what kind of system of what, what kind of thing is this? We know L11. We know A12. What is it? Hmm? Yeah, yeah. I just told you how to do that. That's LX equals B. With what? What is what's the sparsity of LX and B? Of L and B. L is sparse. B is sparse, right? It's, it's, it's a column of a sparse matrix. X will be sparse. Oh, do you know anywhere, do we have a sparse LX equals B solver somewhere here? <laughs> Where is it? Oh, yeah, yeah, that was just last class. See, I told you. This is this LX equals B solver. This is, this is like the Oliver twist in Oliver, you know? This is little Oliver here. He's just gonna pop up all over the place. LX equals B solver. But we're going to specialize this because this Cholesky factor has a lot of beautiful combinatoric graph type structure to it, which we're actually going to be able to augment this solver and make it yet faster Okay, than we did before. Now, wait a minute. You might ask, how can you make it faster? You just made it as fast as you could make it, asymptotically speaking. Yes, I did. But there's two steps to this, right? There's the symbolic part to find the pattern and then to do the numerical work. Okay? It'll turn out that the and both parts, remember, in chapter three took the same amount of time, asymptotically speaking, time proportional to the flop count. Well, what's going to happen here in, with this particular kind of L, when I'm done with it, we'll be able to do the first part in time proportional to the size of the output, which is the non-zero pattern of X which is way a lot less than the flop count. The subsequent part, the numerical work, is unchanged. But the first part, the reach, the reach in the graph is going to be proportional not to the number of edges traversed in the graph, but to the number of nodes traversed in the graph. Wow. That's a big change and a big reduction in time. But I'm getting ahead of myself. It's like foreshadowing in a novel, right? Poor little Oliver is 
can I have Sybil, please? You know, he's gonna he's gonna be he's being foreshadowed here, but so don't don't let me get my, get ahead of myself. So we have a triangular solver. We know how to do this. So we know how to do step one by induction. We know and we know the base case. Uh, we know how to do step two. That's just chapter three. And if that if we stop there, it would be adequate. Okay. And so now, what about this thing? You see anything there that looks familiar? Once you solve step two. I solve set step two for L12. Now I have now I know L11 and know L12. You can plug that in. I can plug this in here, right? So I can write L22 squared equals A22 minus L12 L12 transpose. And then I can take the square root. Is there anything in here that looks familiar? What is L12? What kind of structure, what kind of object is L12? Row or column, matrix, sparse, dense? It's a sparse matrix? It's a sparse column vector. And what is it you're doing to it? What's that? A dot product. Doesn't that look familiar? You're doing that right now. <laughs> right? This is wonderful. There's a, there's a reason to my madness in this pro project two. Look, that's project two right there. You know how to do that. It's a sparse dot product. You're doing it more general case for matrices and well, you know A transpose times B, where the A and B could be different. But now you're doing, you're doing x transpose x for a sparse vector x. Imagine that in your project too. Suppose that was a special case. It's got to be faster because you don't have to search the empties. Exactly. You don't have to, it's a lot of you faster because you don't have to search the empties. The pattern is the same. X, L12 has the same pattern as L12. So you just have to take the sum of the squares of all the non-zero values. You're done. Trivial. So this gives us a scalar. See, I told you you'd know how to do this. It's not that hard. A bunch of equations here, but once you rip it apart and see each equation, you realize, oh, I know how to do that. I've done it already. So this is a scalar now, and then I have a scalar minus a scalar. There's an operator in even C for doing that. It's called the negative you know, minus sign. <laughs> You know how to do that. And the square root of a scalar, we're done. That's it. There's the algorithm. There's Cholesky factorization. Simple, right? So now you know how to do everything. You're done. And we, wait, so what else is there? I mean, that's it. That is it. There's nothing else. We can go home now. Well, not really. OK. We know how to do this asymptotically efficiently because we know how to do, I mean, the only steps of the work are this inductive call. So if by induction we know how to do that, we're done. So we, we already do. So I mean, the, the proof by induction is if I know how to do this, then I can fill in the rest and I'm done, which I've done. Okay. Sparse triangular solve, I know how to do that optimally. And the dot product, I know how to do that optimally. We're done. Well, there's a little bit more to it than that, naturally. What's going to be left is, is other stuff. Okay. Um, and here's the other stuff. The main other stuff is I want to I want to map ahead what I'm doing. I'd like to be able to do what's called a symbolic factorization or symbolic analysis first. And we did that for the triangular solve, right? You first figure out what it is you had to do and where. You get this non-zero pattern, and then you iterate over the pattern, and you do the, the numerical work. The algorithm broke up into two, two distinct phases. A lot of matrix algorithms, sparse matrix algorithms, are like that. 
You break it into two phases. You figure out the pattern, the, the structure. You do the combinatorics first. That tells you then how to do the numerics. And I want to do that for several reasons. Um, first of all, I may want to have a sequence of matrices and I'm factoring all over and over and over again. And the pattern of the matrix won't change, but the values will. That happens a lot in scientific computing because typically what's happening, you're solving at the outer layer, you're solving some nonlinear equation. And to solve a nonlinear equation, you linearize it and you solve a linear system, but you solve it over and over again with different values because it's like a different point in the system. But the structure of the matrix doesn't change. The derivatives are always zero, for example, or the partial derivatives, they're always zero, will always be zero. And some those that will change from positive to neg negative may sometimes touch zero, but then the next step be non-zero. So you have a set of values in A which will, will always be zero and some which will usually be zero, except for an occasional numerical cancellation. But guess what? We ignore those, right? So that's one reason I'd like to do some pre-analysis work to figure out, hey, you know, I'm going to have a sequence of systems to solve. Let me, let me do all the stuff that doesn't depend on the numbers first, and then I'll reuse it and only have to redo this. Imagine if you're doing LX equals B over and over and over again with different right-hand sides, but they all had the same non-zero pattern. You only need to do the reach once, right? Why do it many times? So that's one reason. The other reason is it's really helpful to um, do this analysis because you can, I mean, the, the reasons for doing it are manifold. Okay, one of them is, you know how hard it is to deal with a sparse matrix data structure, right? It's a pain in the neck. Imagine now you're trying to add new entries to this matrix. Look what we're doing. We're building L11 first, and then we're tacking on. We're computing L11 first, and then we're tacking on to the bottom of it L12. And then the diagonal L22. So we're growing this matrix by row. But to solve LX equals B efficiently, I want LX, I want L stored by column. So I can do the reach. Right? If L was stored by row, how would you do the reach? Because you have to go to the node and look at the Look at your neighbors. If, if I had L stored by row, I'd have the edges transposed in reverse direction. And I'd have, the, I'd have the out adjacency in the wrong direction. I'd have the wrong data structure to do a DFS efficiently. Okay, so I need L stored by column if I'm going to use that LX equals B solver from chapter 3. So I need L stored by a column, but you're then tacking on an, en an entry to the end of each column. Imagine that, and you're trying to do that in a sparse matrix data structure. You've got a sparse matrix stored by column, and now I say, okay, tack a new row on to each column. Have fun. Project 2.5. You will not be happy. So what do you do? Well, if only you knew the non-zero pattern of L before you started, or if you just knew how many non-zeros there will be in the end in each column of L, that would be easy, right? Because if I knew ahead of time, before I did any numerical work, if I figured out ahead of time how many non-zeros there will be in each column of L, then I can construct a data structure for L with all these different columns, okay? And then I can just fill it. Every time I see an entry for a new row, I'll just tack it onto the end of those particular columns. So if I have a non-zero in rows two and four, I'll just tack it on there and have a pointer that increments. And then I've got empty space here. And but by the time I'm done, all the columns get filled to how to their precise count. And all the buckets are full. I have every column of L finished. So you can create a static data structure ahead of time and then populate it row by row. And guess what the byproduct is? L is sorted. L has sorted. L is a spockifiable matrix, right? All the row indices are in sorted order because we compute them that way. We compute the first row. See, we compute the first scalar, the 1, 1 first. 
by induction, the base case. And then we grow that and compute the second row, and then the third row, and then the fourth row. So if you're taking the first row and then stuffing it in this matrix, the first row of L, and then you stuff in the, the second row, and then you put in the third row to this matrix, and then the fourth, tack it on the end, and take the fifth row and tack it on the end of the, each column in which it has a non-zero, and so forth, you end up now each column naturally has sorted row indices. That's kind of handy. MATLAB loves it. No extra sorting at the end of the day, which, as you know, is a pain in the neck. So it'd be really nice to figure this out. How many non-zeros are there? This is called the column count of L. And it seems a simple question, right? You wouldn't believe the amount of theory it takes to get to a nice, clean answer to this question. Well, you will believe when we, when we finish. <laughs> OK, it's, 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 it's absurd. I, I think this code here that we're going to, this chapter four, if we take the number of theorems and divide by the lines of code, you might get three <laughs> or pi. I mean, you might get something. It's absurd, really. The, no, the amount of code is extremely small relative to the number of theories that tell you why those lines of code do what they are supposed to do. It's, a, it's insane. It's absolutely insane. You'll be looking at these theorems and I'll have figures that describe the theorems and you'll, you'll, your brain will be exploding with all the combinatorics and at the end of the day we'll, we'll, we'll distill all these theorems down and you'll have that much code. It's astonishing. It really is astonishing. This, this, it, it's beautiful and the math here is, is just, I think it's exquisitely beautiful. Okay, I'm weird. I, I admit that. So, so far, I mean, I'm looking way ahead, right? I'm giving too, too much of the Oliver's story away. Um, but, uh, but this is the outline of where we're going, and you've, you've seen the big pieces now. So here, I guess I already had this on. I should have pulled this slide up. I'm sorry. So I've got this two by two block factorization. That uh, and and I should add again that this is just one method of doing Cholesky factorization. There are many methods. Okay, there's the three equations that I just solved for. I wrote in the chalk already. Uh, and so here now is my MATLAB prototype. This is a fully operational code. Uh, it doesn't work so great for the sparse case because so I just forgot it. Forget the sparse case. I'm creating an n by n dense matrix of all zeros here. So all this does is express this algorithm without recursion, which is simple, right? It's just like the triangular solve because the recursion is what's called a head recursion, right? We do, we do all, I mean, think about what this recursive stuff looks like. To solve a problem of size n, we first solve a problem of size n minus 1, and then we solve a problem of size, size 1. Okay, and then how do you solve a problem of size n minus one? Well, you first solve a problem of size n minus two, and then of size one. How do you solve a problem of n minus two? Well, first, you know, one. And so to do this recursively, you would call this function. This function would first do that, and then this. Well, to do this, it would first do this, and then and so forth. So what's going to happen? You'll do this, and then 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 I guess I should draw it here, and then this. And you'll just go walk from the bottom up, and you're done, right? So that's the iteration. You, there's no need for a stack. With head recursion or tail recursion, there's no tree in the recursion. There's no recursion tree. It's just a chain. And it's really easy to execute a chain. You just work from the bottom, go up, full stop. So. And the induction becomes a loop invariant, which is kind of cool. The loop invariant at the top of this loop says, I have already computed the following. The L11 transpose, L11 times L11 transpose equals A11. And in MATLAB notation, that, that would be the following loop invariant, that L1 colon K minus 1 comma 1 colon K minus 1 e, uh, times itself ditto 
transpose equals, right, I'm not going to repeat that. This is A, uh, 1 colon K minus 1 comma 1 colon K minus 1. That is the loop invariant that would go right here. Okay, do you buy that? Actually, it's free, so you don't have to pay anything for it. <laughs> no, I guess it's not free. You have to pay tuition. So then um, the second thing, once that with, with that loop invariant in place, then I've got to extend this induction. I've got to first do the triangular solve. So here's the triangular solve. This is, this is the equation over there that says L11 times L12 equals A12. There it is written out in all its MATLAB glory. Okay. And then there's the square root and there's the dot product of the matrix with itself, except I've written this uh, a little bit differently um, because L12 transpose, actually no, it's this thing right here. Yeah, L12 transpose is that row, the kth row of L that I just computed in the step above. So this is a row vector times a column vector transposed. No, I'm sorry, times the row vector transposed. So it's a row times a column, which is a, the dot product, right? Take the square root. And we're done. This is a functional algorithm. If you look, at, if you look through C sparse, I forget exactly where I put it, but you'll find. I think you'll find this code in C sparse. If it's not there, it's yeah. I think it's there because I. I think I put in codes like this in a, in the MATLAB directory. Maybe in the demo directory or something like that. I think if you look, you'll find this code. It's in the book, but I also put it in actually the, the software package itself. So you can kind of help to understand it or help see to understand it. So now, now what I'd like to do is go deeper into the, into the theory. What I want to do now is um, I want to look at Oliver Twist, our poor little lonely orphan LX equals B solver. And I want to make Oliver run faster. Okay. And uh, there's some key observations about it, and I think I'll just use the, the overhead here. Um, so you have to look at this picture, and you have to look at this these three equations at the same time. So you know, you're like a tennis court, right? Tennis match. You know, watch the ball go back and forth. Helps to be dyslexic. You can see both at the same time. <laughs> so um, we're doing the Cholesky factorization, then we're doing the triangular solve. But then once we do the triangular solve, we, we do something very special with the output. The output becomes, the result of the triangular solve becomes the kth row of L. Okay. And then we're going to reuse that kth row of L in the next triangular solve. I mean, the next, I mean, we're just going to, we're building L one row at a time, and then we're going to reuse that L over and over again in the triangular solve. So um, we have a very peculiar L. It's growing in a very peculiar way. Every time we do a solve, we slap that solution onto the bottom of L. So um, there's some theorems here, uh, in particular, well, let's see, theorem 4.2 and 4.3, which I think I actually have on the next slide. And here's, here's the next, so I'll state the theorems and we'll go back and explain them. It's probably easier to actually explain them with the picture than here. One theorem says that, and this is kind of trivial, uh, if you have LL transpose equals A, and neglecting numerical cancellation, if A is non-zero in a position, then so is L. Why is that? Well, I'll go back in a minute. So here's this theorem. So A implies L. And then here, and these just come from the LX equals B theorems, right? Remember those two statements about how X becomes non-zero? Well, this is from the first one. This is from the second one. It says 
that uh, basically if, if I've got two non-zeros in L, LJI and LKI, then LKJ will be non-zero, I less than J less than K. Okay, fine. Well, it's easier to view these with this picture. That's why I put the, actually the picture first. So here's this picture. So here's the kth row of L. And at the kth step of factorization, we're going to be computing the kth row of L with a triangular solve. So let's pretend that we're doing the, the, the triangular solve at the kth step right now. So I'm computing this row. Well, when I compute the row, I'm going to do it a sparse triangular solve. I'm going to do the reach, right? With what? With the kth column of A as the right-hand side of my system of equations. So that's this vector here that starts out as. So this xi starts out as, as, as the entry in A, which will be in row I column K. So it's AIK. So if AIK is non-zero, in the solution it's going to stay non-zero because I ignore cancellation. And then this thing gets slapped onto the bottom of L right here. So this entry, when I'm done solving, will become that entry. Do you see that? Right here. I've got this column of A. I do the solve. I get L1, too. So I have, if I have a non-zero here, I'm going to have it in L1 too. It doesn't go away because I don't, I don't make, if I, I avoid, I ignore numerical cancellation. We all, we all do. Okay. Three minus three is non-zero. So, uh, so if this is non-zero, then that will non be non-zero because that entry and that entry are one and the same entry when the solution is done. So that's this one right here. Now, uh, what happens, so if this is non-zero, let's think about what the structure of this column might exist. We know this guy's going to be there. We know for sure now. If that's there, so is that. So we've addressed the existence of this entry. What if there's another entry, LJI, above it? So we have J less than K. Well, if J is less than K, then by the chapter three, reachability, okay, there's an edge from node I to node J. And this is non-zero. There's an edge from I to J, so J will be non-zero. So this non-zero, if it exists, and the existence of this non-zero implies the existence of xj. So that's theorem 4.3 uh, because xj is the same as lkj. Because once I get this triangular solve done, I'm going to take the solution and slap it onto the bottom of this, and this entry will become this entry. Okay, so LJ, the existence of lji and the existence of LKI, which is this entry and that entry, together make LKJ non-zero. That's one of the most important things I've said all day. So if you don't, if you're if you're puzzled, please ask me to explain it again. If you don't follow this, you'll you'll completely misunderstand Chapter Four. I mean, I've shown you numerically what, what's going on. Um, this, so those are, those, those are those two theorems. This is the same as this because you do a triangular solve, you get the answer, and you slap it onto the bottom here. That's on the chalkboard over there. So this and this are the same entry. If there's another LGI above K in column I here, that's non-zero, then that makes X I, XJ non-zero, which then becomes LKJ, because these are one and the same entry, because this becomes K. And so, um, so in other words, these two entries here, LJI and LKI, 
imply the existence of this entry. Because the only way this can become non-zero, if that's non-zero, because it's identically one and the same. And if I've got another one here above it, then that will make this non-zero. So these two imply this. So in any column of L, so the, the upshot is this. In any column of L, and it's the ith column of L, if I have an entry here and an entry here in row J and row K, then together they imply that that entry will be non-zero. Okay, so these two together imply the existence of that entry. So what's so important about that? Well, this is, this is vital because what is it we're doing with this graph of L? We're doing the reach all the time, over and over and over again. We're doing N triangular solves to do the Cholesky factorization. So this is a very powerful statement about the structure of L. It's not just any old L. And any old L will just be a lower triangular matrix that's got a zero free diagonal, but there was no other constraints on L. The non-zeros can be any which way we like in here, I don't care. And the LX equals B solver with the reach and all that, we'll find it. We get a DAG directly to the cyclic graph and so on and so forth. This can be any pattern you like. And that chapter three will work. And it'll do the DFS of the whole graph and so on and so forth. And if this is non-zero and that's non-zero, it doesn't mean that's non-zero. They're completely unrelated. Any non-zero pattern here will, will suffice to make all the theorems in chapter three work. But now we have a very special L. Any pair of non-zeros here means there's a, a non-zero there. So what's so special about that? Think about now what this means to the graph of L, of this L, the Cholesky L. Cholesky didn't realize this about his matrix. He wasn't worried about sparsity. Suppose later on, I want to do a reach, which of course I am. I'm going to do lots of reaches on this graph over and over and over again. But I have this very special case. It's these two imply this one. And so if I touch this node, if this node is in my reach, I'm going to get to this one, and I'm also going to get to this one in my reach. Well, I'll also get this way. So I have two ways of getting to node K. If I have two ways of getting there, why bother with both ways? I could cut one of the ways, and oddly enough, I don't want the shortcut. I want the long way about. Seems backwards, but I want to delete this edge. If I delete this edge, it has no effect on the reach of this graph at all. Because anytime you say, well, wait, if I ignore this edge in the reach, you know, won't you miss something? No. Because if there's, I, I'll only cut it if, if, it's, if there's an entry above it in the column. Okay, so I'll, I'll keep the first one in each column. I'll keep that edge. But anything below it, we're going to remove entirely in the reach, to compute the reach. Because I can delete this, because if there's somebody above it, I know I can get to its destination, K, if two hops instead of one. So we take the graph of L. Of course, numerically, all the numbers are there. But if we take the graph of L and we'll delete all the edges corresponding to any non-zero below the first one. So now we've got a graph that's directed, it's acyclic, and every node has at most one outgoing edge. What is that? It's a tree, yes. It's a tree. It's not a general dag, it's a tree. And now imagine doing a reach on a tree. 
The number of edges is equal to the number of nodes. Doing a reach on the tree takes time proportional to the number of edges. Now that's equal to the number of nodes, which is our sparsity pattern of our result. We've just sliced away a huge amount of our asymptotic time complexity by just ignoring wholesale chunks of our matrix. Symbolically speaking, not numerically. We can't ignore them numerically, but we ignore them in the reach symbolically. So that gives us what's called the elimination tree. And that's like Oliver's second main character is the tree. <laughs> we'll see that guy go throughout. But you get the tree by the triangular solve. So it's a secondary character in the story. Anyway, so I'll stop here and we'll pick up on section uh, basically 4.1 then. That's where we are right now. Uh, next class. And also I'll assign project three. Uh, shortly, too.